Welcome to Focus Today. I'm your host, Perry Atkinson. And, uh, you know, I think we've all are slowly becoming more and more concerned about what is happening with education and the subject of public education. I got to tell you that every time we get on the subject, it uh, always sparks a lot of uh, responses one way or another. But something is happening in our educational system when you can go on the street and ask people basic questions about maybe our U.S. history or what day are we celebrating and what was independence, where did, where did we win our independence from, and you get all these answers that are anything but the truth. So you have to ask yourself, what is being taught in schools today? Well, I'm delighted to have back with us our good friend Jodell Onstott. She is the uh, author of Yahweh Exists. I can revere her as one of the great researchers of our day. And uh, I got to say, if you don't have Yahweh Exist in your library, uh, you need to get a copy of it. It is terrific. Jodell, good to see you. How are you, friend? I am fantastic. Great to be with you this morning, Perry, and discussing these incredible issues. Well, this and is... having the freedom to do it. Well, thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I want to talk to you about education and how uh, has the uh, the philosophy of certain individuals impacted our system. I mean, of course, we have Frederick Nietzsche. Uh, Saul, uh, Saul uh, Alinsky is now, in his book, Radicals or Rules for Radicals has influenced us in a great way. And so what, what's happening from your perspective in our universities and in our public education? What you find at the end of the turn of the 19th century, you know, this would have been right around um, 1890, 1900, you had all these philosophers. You had Karl Marx, you had Frederick Nietzsche, you had all of these individuals that have profoundly affected what we believe a hundred years from now. You wouldn't think that we are still living in the dark ages, but we really are. And what has happened, we have inadvertently accepted these ideas. Our university professors have accepted these ideas, even if they don't always realize that it comes from these philosophers, they accept it, and then they just really enforce that those ideals with our children when they send them to universities. Uh, you see this profoundly at UCLA. You see this at Harvard. You know, you see this at most of your Ivy League schools, and unfortunately, it trickles down to our state schools as well. So we really have to work hard. We have to develop a very strong um, narrative to confront these ideals. Okay, so um, part of this is the scrubbing, I guess, or maybe the elimination of anything that would have to do with uh, Christian history in education. I would assume that that's on the agenda. So when you look at a Frederick Nietzsche or a Saul Alinsky, you ask you gotta ask yourself the question, what do they want? What are they trying to get? What are they trying to sway? What's their agenda? You know, it's it's Funny because what you find, it's actually not funny, it's very um, disheartening. What you find is duplicity in what they say, meaning they say one thing and they will use terms that you and I are very familiar with. They have connotations that have developed through society, but they have a different meaning for those groups, and they use it as a uh, cover. For instance, uh, Antifa, they will use the idea and the phrase that the, the right, that conservative Christians are fascist, that those groups are socialists. They will use all these terms, but they're using these terms as a cover for what they really are. So it's kind of this switch and bait where you use a straw man, you accuse your opponent of something that they do not stand for when really it's what you stand for. Um, you know, this was very effective uh, uh, means and um, propaganda that was used during World War II very effective. And for us, because our children have lost a sound footing in logic, classical logic, because we've lost a sound footing in facts, facts of history, you know, going to primary documents, we have in America a wealth of knowledge, internet access, every single uh, historical document from the American founding fathers is available free and online, but yet we don't appreciate it. You know, our kids would rather be playing video games than studying the documents that 
protect and preserve our liberty. So we really have to confront this. We have to confront it with facts. We have to confront it with logic. And we have to hold accountable because uh, it is a slow erosion that is occurring. And unless we become vigilant and we become uh, warriors in this cause, we're going to lose the liberty and the freedom that we have. Okay, so how serious is this? I mean, we know in, in higher academia, uh, we, we see in this philosophy being propagated. If you get down into the state schools, um, what's so interesting to me is that we, I mean, I know personally good teachers that are trying to combat it. However, they're also combating a union. <laughs> <laughs> and the combination just doesn't allow. Uh, it, it looks like that, well, I want to say this carefully, public school is more interested in social justice and righting the problems with our society uh, socially than it is in what we would call the three R's. So there's a real tug of war going on, even within the system, as to what education is supposed to be. How would you define it? I, I totally agree. You know, I have friends that are professors, friends that are teachers, and those that hold conservative values, they said that in order to survive, they really just have to keep their mouth shut. They can't express any personal views because they will be attacked, they will be labeled, and they will be out of a job. And this is really sad that this type of environment exists in our nation, the one nation on earth that is supposed to allow religious liberty and allow for a variety of opinions. So you find that, again, this comes back to the switch and bait, where you find that these people who identify with radicals, um, they will say one thing and do another. They, you know, they talk all about tolerance, you know, tolerance of, of political views, tolerance of um, where you de de identify as far as gender, a tolerance of everything. But then when you come down to it and you look at their policy, and again, actions speak louder than words, you find that they are the most intolerant group. They spread intolerance and intolerant ideas to our children in the universities. So again, it comes down to we have to develop um, things that hold them accountable. The recent Supreme Court decision regarding unions was a godsend because now teachers are no longer right. forced to be in unions that they disagree with, especially if that union is promoting ideas contrary to your religious beliefs. Not to mention the fact your, your uh, union dues go to candidates that you would never vote for. <laughs> Very true. Let me ask you this before we take a break. The, the whole Saul Alinsky, uh, Alinsky thing, rules for radicals, it's popped up a lot, and you hear it in some of the conservative talk shows, and you've heard about it in the Clinton campaign and even back into the Obama campaign. And when you hear about some of this stuff, I have not read the book. I've seen bits and pieces of it. It's so radical, you kind of go, it, this can't be true, but apparently it is. Can you give us some highlights here? Yeah, it, it really is. And what you find in the book, because I, I have read it, is a duplicity once again. He will say that, you know, this movement is more about revelation than revolution. But then when you read what he actually says, it's all about revolution. Um, one of the people or individuals, entities that they revere is uh, the Christian concept of Lucifer, you know, being the ultimate uh, revolutionary who prompted change in a new kingdom. So it's really the idea of change for change itself, not for anything that's better, not for anything that is substantive. And this is why right now you see the Democratic Party um, losing a narrative. They have no goals. They, everything that they have is really a philosophy of chaos. Chaos um, is really their ultimate goal. Uh, tear down traditional values, anything that your forefathers held on to or believe. We're just wanting change for change itself. And what you're really ended up with is this emptiness. And this is why you do not see a strong message coming out of the Democratic Party. But this is just this current situation. If they um, are wise, you know, which, you know, any entity that is going to survive is going to adapt to change, is going to find a narrative, they will eventually find a narrative that they can unite on. And when they do, and when they keep using these methods, 
that are in the rules for radicals when they still instill uh, chaos and violence and the right does nothing to counter it. We remain silent and complacent. They will gain the upper hand unless we um, forsake our passivity and take an active voice in our future. All right, let me take a break here, uh, Jodell. But when we come back, you, you said something that is real key, and you used the term revelation versus revolution. But in that, to me, is a big issue that I want you to explain to us when we come back. Again, let me say to our viewers and listeners, Jodell Onstott, by the way, Yahweh Exists is her website, and uh, check out that book. You need it in your library, Yahweh Exists. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back. Okay, we're back, and uh, always a delight to have with us uh, Jodell Onstott, uh, researcher, author of Yahweh Exists, and that is also her website, YahwehExists.com. We're talking about education uh, from the higher education into the universities to state education and uh, the left's agenda within the education system, which seems to be growing and paramount. I want to come back to something you said, Jodell, because it sets up something that's very interesting, that in uh, Alinsky's book, Rules for Radicals, dealing with revelation versus revolution, one of the tactics of the left that I've seen, whether it's from Nietzsche or Alinsky or any of the others, is when they say something, they mean exactly the opposite. And if we can just get the simplicity of that in our mind, it does set up a filtering system for us to be more critical in our thinking. If they're saying that the book is about revelation and not re revolution, it's just the opposite because everything that they're doing now is revolution. And revolution is usually associated with some form of violence, right or wrong. Absolutely. Um, again, it's this switch and bait. You say one thing and you do another. And you find that this is the tactic that they use. They will use very benign, very um, enduring terms to uh, characterize their movement, but they hide behind that, you know, and it gives them the shield of protection for what they actually want to, for what they actually do. And, you know, it's hard to believe this uh, double talk or this double think, um, that is what um, some people call it. That's what it's called in Russia is, uh, is a double think, where you say one thing in public and you do another thing in private. Uh, and again, these are communist ideals. And the one thing that we need to be very aware of um, with Nietzsche, as well as with Alinsky, and especially the far left, um, one value that they have that they all agree on is that truth does not exist. There is no empirical truth, nothing in truth. Everything is based on perspe perspective. Everything is based on what we has developed today into modern relativism. And this is, this is really the only dogma that they have. And it really is a destruction of any standing structure, a, a destruction of any standing belief, um, social structure, whether it would be a marriage or whether it would be government, anything that stands Hands in their way. Um, and really, it comes from this source of emptiness of the soul. Uh, they have nothing to hold on to, so they seek to destroy what is. And um, it's like a cancer. It can grow. And the only way that we can confront it is by instilling laws that hold people accountable. It's not through ca countering violence with violence. That is not going to work. That is really just the delusion of society into chaos. But if we will um, adopt and implement righteous laws, laws that hold people accountable for the destruction of private property, holds people accountable for the destruction of government property, and rather forces them to have a narrative that is played out in the courts, a narrative that is played out through open debate. For instance, the Whataburger kid um, that was accosted for having a hat on that another individual disagreed with. I was very, very pleased with his response. You know, he did not respond in kind with violence. Rather, he said, I would like to have a dialogue with you on the issues. I would like to sit down with you and discuss the issues. I mean, he showed so much maturity, two times that of his elder, who should have known better. Beautifully said. Uh, I've seen the slippage of what's happening in public education is it's gone from the silent generation to the boomers, the Xers, millennials. Now we're dealing with 
uh, the Ys and the Z generations on how you want to categorize those. But an example is that you've seen the man on the street, uh, Jodell, when they've asked very people, can you, do you believe the Holocaust existed? Um, we're celebrating independence. Can you tell us what we are independent from? Some say the South. Some say Mexico. I mean, what has happened in education is that these, these truths have been slipped away almost strategically. So my question is this. If, if the left is succeeding in saying the Holocaust didn't exist, that is further down the road than the origin of our Christian foundings, which is probably now on the verge of being totally extinguished. Um, I guess my question that comes out of this, what can we do and what should we do? Well, it really becomes the role and the responsibility of the parent um, in this uh, counter-revolution, really. It's a revolution of ideas. Um, and that is that our fight is not through revolution. It is through revelation. And we ha do that through education, educating your kids. You know, take, um, find really good books. Uh, I do have a list that um, I will post to my Facebook page and um, a list of very good books that um, instill values, Judeo-Christian values that are in line with the Bible, ideas that made our country great. How is it? Th this really gets me. All these people that want change, that don't want America to be what it has been for the last hundred years, they come from oppressive regimes where they have never known liberty and freedom. And they come here and they tell us how it's going to be better. That is the epitome of hypocrisy. But yet our children fall for that. And the only way to keep our children on firm ground is to educate them, set aside time every day on the weekend to read really good content books. Um, you know, Rush Revere has had a lot of good success and a lot of positive feedback. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you also have um, a book about twins who really explore um, the Tuttle Twins. They explore traditional values, and, and they uh, they also investigate the um, the harm of socialism and other liberal policies that you see uh, confronting us. There are so many I, things out there that are good resources. Prager University. I cannot say enough about Prager University. Five to seven minute videos that you can sit down, watch with your kids, have an incredible discussion afterwards. There's fantastic resources, but we have to be diligent. We cannot be laid back. We cannot say, you know, it's it's hard. You come home from work. You come. The kids come home from school. We're tired. You know, you cook. You go to soccer. What time is there left in the day to invest in our kids? But yet, if we don't, if we let this opportunity slip from us, we've lost that next generation. So this is really the most important thing that parents face today is educating our children because the schools are not going to do it. And what they do teach is going to be contrary to the values that have given us the liberty we enjoy today. Well, let me say to our viewers and listeners, uh, Jodell has given me a list here, and she's going to put these on her website. So you can go to YahwehExist.com. But she talks about the Rush Revere series, what would George do, the, the Nan Marshall series, uh, the Pregner, Prager University, Ben Shapiro's uh, for older teens, uh, which is the dailywire.com. There's a lot of resources, websites and books and printed material for you to get a hold of. And let me encourage you to seriously take a look at this. Uh, Goodell, it boils down to that if we take the Judeo-Christian fundamentals out of our culture and we replace it with humanism, then humanism begins to define morality. And morality then becomes what's pleasurable at the moment. There is no morality. How close are we to being there? With the next generation, I think we are very close. Um, even in conservative communities, I have seen the younger generation, you know, this uh, X and Y generation, or the Z generation, um, where they have accepted the idea that there is no truth, there is no God. God is dead for them. 
And what God does exist is a God of their own making. Rather than saying, well, we actually do have a text, let's hold ourselves accountable to it. Those ideas have just really been thrown out the door. So I think this is a work for people in ministry. It's a work for pastors, a a work for youth leaders to really develop this narrative, make it fun, uh, make it engaging and wake up a new generation who will be warriors for truth, who will stand for what is right. Um, The one thing that the narrative that this far radical left presents is the idea that people like you and I, who hold to values that there is a right and there is a wrong, um, that we are actually evil, that we we are dark inside because we believe that uh, there are more moral imper- uh, imperatives. And we have to counter this. We have to give solid reasoning and we have to be persuasive. And by that, I think that we will prevail. I mean, truth always prevails. Yeah. The key is we have to educate. You know, you're hitting, you're just hitting the bullseye here because I believe that we are on the threshold with all this chaos going on. There is a genuine hunger in the country for a moral order to be restored. I mean, the rebellion could be, um, the rebellion could be by doing good. <laughs> mm-hmm. The rebellion could be by reestablishing a moral authority and a moral order because it's so chaotic that even non-believing people don't like the way it's going. They want something restored in their way of morality. So it seems like to me the door is now being opened for us to go the other direction. It really is. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no problem. I get it. We. For those of us who talk for a living, that happens. <laughs> okay. By the way, why she's uh, captioning so Yahweh is yhwhexists.com. That's her website, yahwehexists.com. It is incredibly resourceful. And later she'll have posted these other books and websites as a resource for you to go to. Um, anyway, give you a chance to respond to that. No problem. What do you got? <laughs> I don't don't know. I got a dry throat this morning. Uh I totally agree. Um, Yeah, it really comes behind. Oh, thank you. My son is bringing some water. Thank you, honey. (laughs) No problem. (laughs) Ah, This is how we do it. (laughs) Kindness, teaching kindness. Uh Uh, So what you find today, too, with the rise of Islam here in American culture, it is the only thing that does not apologize. (laughs) Excuse me for the beliefs it holds. Yeah. And I think that is one reason why you see those numbers growing, where in both Judaism and Christianity, you see those numbers shrinking. We have really reverted to the role of pacifist rather than standing strong for what we believe. Wow. And until we return to that strength, you know, <laughs> it's again, <laughs> sorry. <clears throat> this is why Trump has been so effective. He doesn't apologize. No matter what he does, no matter what he stands for, he stands firm. Um, Whether it's right or wrong, he stands for it. And that is the strength that America is looking for, that this next generation needs for truth to prevail and to return to values that make us strong and keep us free. I'm going to let you go and recover. Thank you. Uh, I totally get that. I've had that happen to me many, many occasions. Thank you so much. Let me say to our viewers and listeners, go to YahwehExist.com. Jodell's book is there, but also the list of these other books that she's referring to. Parents, get involved. Take time. Make time. Uh, There's some great websites and great publications that are available for you to uh, have for your own library at home and for you to teach your children with. Thank you, Jodell. God bless you. Thanks for what you do. We'll connect again soon. See you later. We'll be right back.